Now, it goes without saying that cardiac imaging, and especially over the last decade or so, has provided, uh, has played an important role in uh, complementing the findings that you guys are um, providing from uh, the right heart uh, catheterization. It is important because it does screen for possible pulmonary hypertension, and uh, of course can uh, provide quantification and also risk stratification. But more importantly, and I'm going to show you a couple of slides towards the end of my talk, it might provide an ideal tool for monitor the response, perhaps in a non-invasive way. However, it's nice to say that, but the, at the same time, we are facing with a rather complex anatomy of uh, the right ventricle. Apart from the fiber orientation, as well as the pyramidal kind of uh, architecture, as well as structure of the right ventricle, which is considered you know, erroneously in the past are a rather simple structure, but that's not the case. Now, I would like to introduce at this stage the concept of echocardiography, and I'm going to spend most of my talk today showing how echocardiography had in, has indeed shaped the way that we are dealing today with pulmonary arterial hypertension. The reason I would like to say that, that echocardiography, in a sense, it does provide what's called the point of care. In other words, it's widely available, it is uh, cost-effective, therefore does not pose as well any risk to the patient. And more importantly, can go to the side of the patient in a nice way. However, we are facing problems. And I said earlier on that the asymmetric, if not pyramidal, uh, structure of the right ventricle does not help us from the calculation point of view. Equally, its uh, retrostenal uh, location also poses a problem, especially when it comes to the penetration of the ultrasound. But more importantly, and I'm going to show you in the next slide, is what we are facing, which is actually the epidemic of our 21st century, is the obesity. Now, here with I'm showing you an MRI of a patient with a larger, with quite significant uh, large habitus. Now, if echocardiography is successful, it has to penetrate, you can see, the fat over here, the adipose tissue between the right ventricle sitting over here, which I, I, I can point uh, to you, and also the front of the chest. That's approximately uh, about six centimeters. Now, what I'm trying to get over here is for echocardiography to be successful in this kind of patient would be like a mission impossible. Now, Moving forward, I'm going to spend some time telling you how do we assess uh, uh, right, the right ventricle either in patients with a suspected pulmonary arterial hypertension or even established. And we start first of all with uh, the most important one, which is actually the first target organ damage, which is nothing else but the right uh, ventricular uh, uh, diastolic dysfunction. That's really, really easy to imagine. The pressure mounts within the right atrium because of the obstruction ahead, then transmitted down to the right ventricle, and that causes stiffening of the right ventricle. The question is how to identify that. And please remember, this is the first target organ damage. In, a, in one way, it's not that similar from what's happening in, pulmon in arterial hypertension. The way we are facing that is through the tricuspid valve inflow with a tissue Doppler. It does provide two waves, the ENA and the deceleration time. And if we use those criteria, we can really define a way whereby assessing those, assuming we're able, of course, to obtain, we can see whether the right ventricle has indeed some degree of diastolic dysfunction or has a restriction. This is an important issue because the degree of diastolic dysfunction clearly affects the right atrial size. And that's an important issue to understand. So we are moving through the patholo pathophysiological process equally and nicely followed up by echocardiography, right ventricular dysfunction, moving to the right atrial dilatation. But again, it's easy to say, but there has to be a way whereby we can quantify that. This is easily quantified with echocardiography. And here with I'm showing you an image of four chambers of cold view, whereby the rate atrium is traced around in a nice way. Now, this, this, important, this is important because the index, in other words, 
the actual area measured in uh, comparison with uh, the actual uh, patient size, it does provide an idea of the outcome. I'm showing you a really interesting study of 81 patients with severe pulmonary hypertension, which they were followed up for 37 months. Now, what I'm showing you over here is that the assessment of the right atrial size, which is indexed by uh, body surface, it did pre predict actually the outcome over a period of uh, nearly uh, 37 months, which is about four to five years. And there were other parameters equally like pericardial effusion and so forth, the eccentricity index, which I'm going to touch based upon. But the point I'm trying to make, such a simple measure, it does predict the outcome in terms of transplantation and mortality, and also it does predict the degree of freedom of, uh, of symptoms. So. We are moving through the process, moving from stiffness of the right ventricle, moving to the dilatation of the right atrium. But all that brings to what is the hallmark of the whole process. In other words, it's a dysfunction of the systolic function of the left ventricle. Now, we've done it in cardiology, and one may see a reason to do it as well. Is in this kind of case, we do what's called the eyeballing. You look at it, you looks dilated. Here the right ventricle in both cases looks pretty dilated, if not the same size as the left ventricle. It's called eyeballing. But it's not quantitative, it's only qualitative. This is not going to fly if we are going to deal effectively our patients. Therefore, there was the need of standardizing, if not quantifying. And way, one way of doing that is to trace around the area measured by echocardiography and do what is called the percentage of the fractional area change. This is a fairly robust way. The problem which introduces is that the human factor is an important and the time, of course, which as well takes to do it. So we have moved to something simpler. What about if the right ventricle does dilate and therefore we're able to calculate simply one of the uh, perpendicular uh, diameters and as well as the transverse diameter as seen here in the, uh, from the um, uh, four chamber view. And equally, if we measure the thickness of the right ventricular wall, again obtained by two-dimensional echocardiography, then we have a full assessment not only of the dimensions, but as well as of the thickness. And somehow, both those measures taken either in isolation or in combination, it does provide a fairly kind of um, uh, robust way of associating with uh, uh, outcome. This is a study with 72 patients with, uh, a pulmonary, with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, followed up for 38 months, which is fairly kind of standard. And the mean RV wall thickness here seen into the top of, the, of, the, of your screen as well as the diameter, it did predict fairly from the beginning and the, the, the lines actually with a cut of points, and I'm not going to spend time on that on the numbers, but it's just the concept that the thickness as well as dilatation, it does have a significant impact on how we are treating or how these patients are fairly long term. Now, most of you folks, you'll be much kind of uh, um, accustomed with what's the, the concept of the TAPSI, which is nothing else like an M mode through the right ventricular wall. And just what it really picks up is just the systolic deformation of the right ventricle. It's exceedingly uh, easy to use. The M mode has a very good spatial temporal resolution. In other words, even in difficult images, this might be pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty easy. And what we really measure is actually the deformation in time. Now, there is a pitfall over here. It does not actually reflect the, um, it doesn't reflect the global, but not the regional motion abnormality. Abnormalities. Perhaps for you it's not important, it's more important in cardiology, in processes that affect the ventricle, perhaps in a segmental way. Nevertheless, again, this is the cutoff point is about 16 millimeters here. I'm showing you a study whereby there were 63 patients with primary pulmonary hypertension, and the TAPS in this kind of case actually once again had a robust way of predicting the outcome, both in terms of death as well as um, time to transplantation. 
Now, this is an important issue because this is easy to measure and is fairly reproducible. And moving a little bit forward, we have moved from the diastolic dysfunction, the stiffening of the right ventricle, to dilated right atrium, to the systolic dysfunction, and now we are looking of ways how we can be more precise of identifying that. We know, for example, that the right ventricle actually deforms, in other words, contracts in various directions. And one way of picking that up is perhaps moving or trying to trace or pick up the movement of the tricuspid mitral valve annulus by using a, a modality which is called tissue Doppler. This is fairly straightforward. I'm showing you a case over here. This is a systolic wave, as prime is called, in a normal patient, it's about 10 centimeters per second, whereby to the right-hand side, you can see a fairly uh, reduced systolic excursion as measured by uh, tissue Doppler, which is fairly about five uh, centimeters per second. This is a very sensitive way of predicting the mean pulmonary artery pressure and the PVR in patients with um, uh, suspected chronic uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension. And that's an important uh, finding too. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I think, again, the human factor, it, com it comes in a way whereby it complicates matter. You might have heard perhaps of the T index, which is a way of the myocardial performance index, which takes into account both the systolic and diastolic function. This is a little bit complicated, and truly I would not spend a lot of time because it's time consuming, and therefore I do not think it's ready for prime time, if not routinely using clinical practice. But what universally you see, and I must all time from summer, what is the tricuspid regurgitation in patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension. The reason behind that is very simple. It's because we can calculate the, the right ventricular systolic pressure and by definition the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. The limiting factor, of course, is to pick up the tricuspid regurgitation. In other words, the amount of fluid that comes back into the right atrium. Here I'm showing you three cases. A normal case whereby you can see there is virtually no pulmonary and no tricuspid regurgitation. A mild case with um, aliasing of the color going back to the right atrium and a fairly kind of severe pulmonary uh, tricuspid regurgitation giving a, a calculated pulmonary artery systolic pressure of above 60 millimeter of mercury. Now, the important thing over here is we can calculate that by using a combination of the pulmonary artery systolic pressure and also the uh, dilatation, if not the, uh, the compression of the uh, IVC. This is very good for screening because it does correlate in some way with the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. And I'm showing you this uh, particular graph whereby it was the first one of the first validations that pulmonary artery systolic pressure, as evaluated by echocardiography, it does correspond with invasive measurements. It has a limitation, and I'm happy to take questions after that. But let us go back to what's happening to the, to the right ventricle. It has become stiff, then the right atrium delays, the, the systolic pressure increases, and then it has a detrimental effect on the curvature, in other words, on the septum. Normally, it does not bulge during diastole, but as the pressure mounts up, what it happens instead of being a passive, it becomes fairly active and bulges into the left ventricle, whereby you can see it over here in severe kind of cases to, the, to your right-hand side. Now, there are various measures about that. There are, it's called, one is called sphericity index. It's used in some of your pH uh, trials, but I think, again, the, the human factor plays an important uh, role. I would like, however, to show you a different concept to me, as cardiologist, I think the factor, the fact that the right ventricle, that the septum, it goes into the uh, left ventricle during the diastole, is exceedingly important because it does affect the cardiac output, and this is a very important issue. This is a <laughs> study performed in patients with circumferential strain, in other words, the deformation of both the left and the right ventricle. And what really shows that the, the um, 
the maximum deformation of the right and the left ventricle do not occur at the same time, simply because the interference of the septum it causes them this kind of uh, asynchrony, if you wish. So the impact on both the cardiac output and the stroke volume, both from the left and right hand side, is really deleterious in this kind of case. Now, the rule of the thumb, if you ask any of the echocardiographers, any of the cardiologists, what they have been shown robustly to predict the outcome from an echocardiographic point of view are the following. Pericardial effusion, um, index right area, uh, the Tay index, the curvature, which I showed you earlier on, and of course, the TAPSI, which I showed you earlier on. Now, if we had to put it all together, in cases of uh, moderate pulmonary hypertension, we start with pulmonary with tracheospid regurgitation, gives rise to um, pulmonary rise, pulmonary artery systolic pressure as calculated. Then this rise from the other side in systolic dysfunction, and finally you can see quite a lot of engorgement within the IVC. We have spent a significant amount of time in Glasgow looking into ways how we can identify those vulnerable patients that we do suspect that might have pulmonary arterial hypertension, but they have not manifested themselves, at least on resting echocardiography. Here with I'm showing you a very interesting case of a young guy with scleroderma, whereby, as you can see, to your left hand side, at rest, there is no evidence of uh, increasing pressure within the right ventricle by judging the movement of the right of the septum. However, what happens at exercise is a treadmill exercise, and immediately afterwards we do obtain uh, images. You can see a clear bulge of the septum in diastole. Again, this is a fundamental way to suggest that the pulmonary artery is installing pressure. There's no other explanation for that. It has increases in this kind of patients. So colleagues now are moving to a more exciting way of looking into patients with pulmonary hypertension. We are now embracing the technology as in, uh, technology has embraced the echocardiography in the last few years. We're able now to identify segment by segment of the right ventricle and the left ventricle in a way which is called strain, in other words, deformation. This provides unique information upon how the right ventricle, wall by wall, segment by segment, it does contract. And we came to understand that the way that behaves in patients well before the pulmonary artery systolic pressure increases, it is revealing certainly from the right ventricular point of view. This is a very interesting study looking on the longitudinal strain of the right ventricle with two-dimensional echocardiography and shows a very clear correlation of this kind of deformation pattern easy to obtain with pulmonary artery systolic pressure as well as with the function of the left ventricle. So for the first time, we're able to correlate deformation structure to function or to physiology, which is the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. But more importantly, and I'm fascinated by this particular study, is this study over here whereby for the first time, we're able to identify what's called a cutoff point. In other words, what is the number whereby above or below that, the outcome changes on these kind of patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. This is a very interesting study with quite a large number of patients, albeit with various etiologies of pulmonary hypertension, nevertheless with a good chunk, about one third of them, with pulmonary arterial hypertension, whereby the longitudinal strain, in other words, the deformation of the right free wall, was assessed by echocardiography, and the patient will follow that for up to 2.6 years. You can see the two curves seen over here into your um, couple of media curves, it's really uh, vary since the beginning, and that's an important issue. It suggests this kind of simple measure it does predict in a very precise way what's going to happen to our, those, our patients. Now, it comes a very simple question. So what's the best then? Which one should be using from this kind of point of view? So this is a trial whereby all those measures I mentioned to you earlier to assess the RV function has been put together. And guess what? Once again, 
the right ventricular strain, what I mentioned earlier on, it had become the best predictor of right ventricular uh, ejection fraction and volume changes as time goes by. Now, I would like to spend a little bit more time looking again at the technology in a way where kind of you can see in the future. And finally now, the technology has helped us so much to derive from those simple 2D images and moving to three-dimensional echocardiography. Here I'm showing you how can we, from the two dimensions of the right ventricle, move to three dimensions with no limitation in terms of uh, angle or even of uh, cuts or views. This provides a unique ability to measure the right ventricular volumes and injection fraction similar to that of the MRI. This is a very important study because for the first time shows that if you consider cardiac MRI as the gold standard of assessment of the right ventricle in terms of function, volumes, and uh, so forth, then three-dimensional echocardiography did extremely well in comparison to the gold standard as far as the inter-observer and intra-observer variability concerned and also as, uh, as predictor. Now, how does it really affect you? And this is the key point I'm trying to, to bring today in my talk. It does affect you because, firstly, it can reduce the sample size of your studies. If you use a technique whereby the one of your end point might be the right ventricle, and necessarily has to be right ventricular function in a way whereby it's robustly assessed, then using the dimensional echocardiography in comparison to cardiac MRI, which is not widely available, it reduces the sample size and also, and that's an important issue uh, again, it does provide an accurate assessment as good as that of the MRI. And equally, by using this technique, we came to understand a different kind of pattern, but please I would like to, to, to focus on this one. This is an extremely fascinating from the cardiology point of view because we are accustomed to say that the right ventricle becomes sick simply because it becomes stiff, but then subsequently the right atrium dilates and that affects the right, uh, affects the tracuspid annulus, which gives rise to tracuspid regurgitation and the, vice, the vicious cycle starts again. But perhaps it's not the same, or certainly it is not the same for all processes. Now we know, for example, that the removing of the tracuspid annulus, thanks again to three-dimensional echocardiography, is fairly different when it's pulmonary arterial hypertension, sorry, I'm going to go back to this one, in comparison to uh, chronic uh, thromboembolic disease. One is restricted, the other one is dilated. How it can affect? Well, we have seen it, for example, in aortic valve disease, whereby narrowing of the heart valve improved the outcome. Perhaps something to consider in this uh, kind of way. But here I'm showing you a 3D speckle, perhaps looking in the future, whereby three-dimensional echocardiography is propelled to look into a different way. But I'm going to finish my talk just showing you some images on uh, cardiac MRI. I have no doubt, and uh, I do all the cardiac modalities, that cardiac MRI is indeed the gold standard. Herewith, I'm showing you a case whereby you can see the right ventricle being dilated, hypokinetic. There is some degree of pericardial effusion. The right atrium is dilated. Then you can appreciate very closely that the septum bulges during diastole. So this is goes beyond. It's like eye opening, right, in comparison to echocardiography. Now. Equally, MRI is superb in uh, associating the complication. Here with, I'm showing you a case of uh, scleroderma with uh, bilateral dilated pulmonary arteries. And clearly, there is evidence of the diastolic bulging the pericardial effusion. But what has been appreciated, and this is an important issue I'm bringing to you, the folks, today, is the degree of fibrosis within the right ventricle. It does predict the outcome. I think it's fascinating. So what it happens is very simple. Then because of the pressure within the right ventricle, there is tension within those fibers that they come near to the septum, they're called RV insertion points, superior and inferior. They're becoming ischemic, and those cells are dying, and they're subsequently substituted by collagen, they're becoming fibrotic. And they're easily picked up 
you can see here with the arrow, with the arrows by gadolinium, which is called late gadolinium enhancement. The presence of this uh, RV insertion point is important twofold. Firstly, nearly gives you the diagnosis. Most of the patients, about two thirds of your patients, they will have this kind of uh, uh, pattern. Second, it does predict outcome. It does make sense, actually. Fibrosis is always associated with bad outcome. Here I'm showing you a very interesting study, which was published fairly recently, actually, about 58 patients with um, uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, fall up about 10 months, very kind of short. But nevertheless, the presence or absence of this kind of fibrosis over and above, it did predict the outcome in terms of, uh, as the, the, the authors had, had uh, um, uh, established in terms of clinical outcome, death, the compensator had heart failure. But what the point I'm trying to make over here, the separation of the two curves happens nearly instantaneously. So the presence of fibrosis identifies sick ventricle already. Now, this uh, predicts as well in long term, uh, the MRI simply because it's so sensitive in uh, assessing the volumes, the outcome indeed actually, if we are to assess the patient in terms of stroke, uh, volume, uh, right ventricular and diastolic volume and so forth, it does really make a difference. But the point, the last point I would like to make over here is that MRI, it can actually predict within a year in terms of repeated assessments the changes of the volumes whereby it will affect the, 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 the overall outcome. Here is one year of the same kind of study I showed you earlier on, whereby the right ventricular volume assessment and the systolic volume and then systolic volume over and above had the next and predictive um, uh, power in, uh, in, in picking up the outcome. So that introduces the last concept of my talk. You do it very expensive studies. Perhaps you might need those kind of modalities that are able to give you the smaller sample size, the better kind of uh, um, estimation of your um, outcome. This is a very good uh, um, review, which I will thoroughly recommend you to read. It's actually a point made by this author on regards of the use of cardiac MRI for repeatability, if not for uh, assessment of those kind of patients participating in clinical trials. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say that cardiac imaging is ideally posed in assessing right ventricular function, right ventricular complication, and also for the first time the outcome. I think novel echocardiographic measures might be able to provide complementary information. I have no doubt that cardiac MRI, although it's the best uh, test and the gold standard, however, it is equally not widely available. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So uh, this is a table from Circulation 2006 that look at several markers of RV dysfunction uh, that are associated with clinical status and prognosis. These are markers by echocardiography, right heart cath, and even cardiac MRI. So uh, Nico went through a bunch of these already. But this is from the Revere Registry, and this is the Cox Proportional Hazard Estimate for Multivariable Model of Survival. And as you can see down in the hemodynamic, uh, from the right heart cath measurements, uh, in association with the PVR, the mean right atrial pressure is highly associated uh, and predictive of survival or actually mortality in patients with PAH. And this is from the French registry. And again, in the hemodynamics, we see that the right atrial pressure is associated with increased mortality in patients with PAH. Again, just to emphasize the importance of RV dysfunction, this is a, a summary from the European Respiratory Review 2011. So this uh, table shows, again, different right heart parameters measured by echocardiography uh, that are uh, pertinent to prognosis and PAH. So we can see pericardial effusion, right atrial size, right ventricular diameter, TAPC, the TIE index, tri tricuspid valve regurgitation, among others. And in the same review, there's another table that summarizes the different uh, measurement of RV dysfunction. This is by cardiac MRI, <coughs> and uh, Nico already went over some of these, so ventricular mass index, 
red ventricular dilatation, stroke volume, RV ejection fraction, and the ratio of myocardial fibrosis to RV ejection fraction. So the, all this is just to put in perspective how important the RV is to, uh, to, improve, uh, to improve survival in patients with PAH. So I'm going to touch a little bit about the difference between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. I'm going to talk about the differences embryologically, anatomically, and physiologically. So I'm sure none of us remember this, but embryologically, the heart is formed from a diffusion of two endo, uh, endocardial tubes that come together, they fuse, they enlarge and rotate, and then the chambers of the heart and the great vessels form. However, the right ventricle and the left ventricle have different origins. The precursor cells of the left ventricle come from the primary heart field. Those of the right ventricle come from the anterior heart field. So the origin of the right ventricle differs from that of the left ventricle. Another important point is that in the embryo and in the fetus, the right ventricle is the dominant chamber. However, after birth, the left ventricle takes over and becomes the main chamber and the RV works mainly as a conduit. Anatomically, there's also differences between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So the shape is different. The right ventricle is triangular from the side and crescentic in cross-section. The muscle fibers that form the... Okay, so I hope this is better. So the muscle fiber in the right ventricle are in two layers, circumferential and longitudinal, and the contractility. Okay, I'm sorry, I guess we're having a problem with my voice. So the muscle fiber uh, of the right ventricle are, are in two layers, circumferential and longitudinal, and as such, the contractility of the right ventricle is mainly longitudinal shortening. In addition, the right ventricle is uh, highly uh, trabeculated. Do you guys hear me in Cleveland? Yeah, okay, so I'll continue. In addition, the valve on the right side of the heart differs from those on the left side of the heart, and the tricuspid valve is, has the largest annulus. It's tethered by more than three papillary muscles, and as such is at high risk of structural deformities. Uh, from the standpoint of energy and perfusion, the right ventricle has lower oxygen requirement compared to the left ventricle, and it has a lower coronary blood flow. When there's ex increased oxygen demand to the right ventricle, these increased oxygen demand uh, are met by increased coronary blood flow or increased oxygen extraction. So how does the RV adapt uh, to increase pressure? such in the case of pulmonary arterial hypertension. The RV response to the pathological load will depend on the nature, the severity, and the chronicity of the insult. And the RV remodeling is in two parts. So there's the initial, initial adaptive remodeling, and then there's the maladaptive remodeling. And we'll talk about this in more details later. So we're going to be focusing on the pulmonary arterial hypertension as the insult to the RV. So there's RV pressure overload. This leads to increased RV wall stress. And then there's activation of different pathways. There's neurohormonal and immunological activation. There's altered bioenergetic, ischemia, and mitochondrial remodeling. And all this leads to myocardial remodeling. There's hypertrophy, there's uh, matrix remodeling, and increase in RV contractility. And then the, the myocardium will either go into adaptive remodeling, where the uh, RV arterial uh, coupling is maintained, or there's maladaptive remodeling, and then there's ischemia, arrhythmias, and the RV dilates and, uh, and fails. So as such, the RV adaptation and remodeling is complex, and it doesn't only, uh, only depend on the severity of the pulmonary vascular disease, but also it depends on the neurohormonal activation, it depends on coronary, coronary perfusion, on my, uh, myocardial metabolism, it depends on the rate and time of uh, development of the pulmonary hypertension, and it also depends on genetic and epigenetic factors. So when we talk about uh, adaptive remodeling, adaptive remodeling is when there's concentric remodeling. 
The systolic and diastolic function of the RV are preserved. The RV maintains normal side or maybe there's mild dilatation. In maladaptive remodeling, there are more eccentric hypertrophy, there is worsening systolic and diastolic function, and the RV enlarges. This is a nice uh, picture from Jack from 2013, and it shows the, uh, the cellular changes uh, with, in, in the RV when the RV is facing the increased pressure and in the pulmonary vasculature. So as the pulmonary vasculature uh, remodels and the pulmonary vascular resistance increase, changes occur in the, in the myocardium. So at the endothelial cell level, there's increased apoptosis and decreased angiogenesis. The myocardium is gonna uh, feel that and there's increased fibrosis. At the cellular level, so at the cellular level, different pathways are activated. There's in, uh, increased glucose uh, uptake. There's shift uh, to glycolysis. There's mitochondrial changes, uh, mainly bioenergetic. There's increased oxidative stress and increased uh, ROS. And there's also alteration in the gene expression. OK, so uh, I'm going to uh, move now to talk a bit more about RV management. So I'm going to start by talking uh, about the approved PAH therapy and how they affect the RV function. So the first class are prostacyclin, and prostacyclin is the oldest drug available to treat pulmonary hypertension. It has been shown to improve survival. Prostacyclin causes uh, pulmonary vasodilation, and it improves cardiac output and decreases uh, cardiac filling pressure. So the effect of prostacyclin on the RV, the data is not very strong. The, there's one animal model where they used iloprost and they show that there's improve, uh, it improves RV contractility and it reduces fibrosis regardless of pulmonary artery pressure. However, in clinical data, there has not been a direct effect of prostacyclin on the RV. The data on, of the effect of prostacyclin on the heart are more on the left side of the heart. And in these patients with LV failure, when prostacyclin was used, there was increased mortality. Uh, the second class of drugs are the endothelin receptor blockers. So endothelin is increased in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Endothelin 1 increases pulmonary vascular tone and um, increased cardiac myocyte uh, contractility. Also, there's not much in terms of either preclinical or clinical data showing a direct effect of the endothelin receptor on the RV function. However, in uh, experience with left-sided heart failure, the endothelin receptor blockers had unfavorable effect on, uh, in these patients. Uh, in treating patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, we haven't found any uh, detrimental effect of uh, this class of drug on the RV. The third class of drug and the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension are the PDE5 inhibitor and the soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator. So PDE5 inhibitor cause pulmonary vasodilation and they have some antiproliferative property. They uh, signal through cyclic GMP uh, and they have a protective effect on the heart by uh, preventing apoptosis and blunting the hypertrophic response. So these are the drugs uh, on which we have most data on their effect on the RV. So there are several studies and neuron model where they use PDE5 inhibitors and they show that uh, these in, uh, there's improvement in RV diastolic function and some uh, reduction in the fibrosis independent of afterload. Uh, clinical data looking at uh, this class of drug uh, in PAH, uh, they didn't show direct effect on the RV. However, again, from, our, uh, the, from uh, using them in LV failure with preserved or decreased uh, ejection fraction, the initial data were a bit promising, but the more recent data did not uh, meet primary endpoint. So, um, here we're gonna, this, is, this table shows the preclinical study, uh, a summary of some of the preclinical studies, so the animal models where they used uh, right ventricular targeted therapy. So different models have been used, the monocrotalin uh, rat model, the PA banding model, and the hypoxia uh, model. And different drugs have been used to try to see if they affect the RV function. And these are the studies that show that 
these different drugs kind of affect RV hypertrophy, RV remodeling, our RV uh, function. And uh, we're going to be focusing on some of them. I'm not going to go through all of them. So uh, uh, more and more interest has been given to beta blocker and, treat, uh, and, and targeting uh, RV and PAH. And this is learning from the cardiology experience. So beta blocker is, uh, has a central role in treatment, uh, in, in treatment uh, of uh, left heart failure. It improves uh, outcome in one third of patients uh, with LV heart failure. So why don't we use it to treat the RV failure and, uh, and pulmonary arterial hypertension? In fact, in pulmonary arterial hypertension, similar to LV failure, uh, there's increased activity of the sympathetic nervous system. And there's decrease in the number and down regulation of the beta adrenal receptors. However, uh, it has always been uh, the saying that we shouldn't use beta blocker in patients with PAH mainly for concern that these patients rely on their uh, heart rate uh, because they can't improve their stroke volume, so they rely on that for their exercise. So due to concerns in reduction of heart rate, decreased contractility, and because of concern of systemic vasodilation, we haven't been using beta blockers in PAH, and we, we actually we had been stopping beta blockers in patients who have a diagnosis of PAH. And this is also based on uh, two studies, uh, uh, based uh, both of them in patients with portopulmonary hypertension. So there was a case report of a patient with portopulmonary hypertension uh, who had uh, was started on beta blocker and had a hemodynamic collapse. And there's another study where patients with portopulmonary hypertension they withdrew propranolol and the patient did better and had improvement in exercise tolerance. So based on uh, these data, beta blockers have not been used in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. So over the year, uh, more recent years, there's more and more interest in using this drug category to treat the RV failure and PAH. And there's several studies using animal models, different animal models of PAH using beta blockers, mainly carvederol and bisoprolol, and now more recently nabivolol. And these studies have shown that uh, beta blocker actually improve exercise tolerance, improve RV capillarization and function, and they actually improve RV arterial coupling. So this is one of the major studies, and uh, it looked at two uh, models of, uh, uh, of pH, the SU5416 hypoxia rat and the monocrotalin rats, and they used carvedilol uh, uh, as the beta blocker. And in the hypoxia rat model, uh, here we can see uh, the, the, pay, uh, the rats that uh, got placebo, and this is the carvedilol treated rats. So at the level of the pulmonary vasculature, carvedilol had no effect. So there was no change in the angioproliferative pulmonary vascular remodeling. However, when we look uh, uh, macroscopically at the heart, there's definitely less RV hypertrophy in the, in the carvedilol treated group. This was also shown by a reduction in RV weight to body weight, as shown here. And there was also a reduction in the cardiomyocyte area in the carvedilol-treated group. This, however, was not associated with a reduction in RVSP. In addition, in the carvedilol-treated group, RV function improved, and this is shown by a reduction in RV internal diameter at the, during diastole and by an improvement in TAPSI, as shown here, and an improvement in, uh, in exercise uh, tolerance. Here in the lower panel, we, uh, we, saw, uh, we see the echo picture. This is a normal heart. This is the rat that was not treated with carvedilol, so we see some RV hypertrophy and septal thickening. And here we see that there's a bit reversal of the RV hypertrophy and, uh, I mean, septal flattening. Also not shown here is that the, the carvedilol treated rats had uh, increase in the uh, RV and the myocardium capillarization and some reversal of the fibrosis. And the monocrotalin uh, rat, when they treated them with uh, carvedilol, they showed improved survival as shown uh, in this uh, first panel A. And this was associated with improvement in RV function. Uh, by TAPSI and by right ventricular internal diameter during diastole coming down. 
And in the monocrotalin uh, rats, they, uh, they found that the, the, the rats treated with carvedilol, there was an effect on the pulmonary vascular remodeling with fewer muscularized artery and a reduction in the medial thickness. And in these rats, there was improvement in the pressure overload. Uh, at least uh, there was a trend with the RVSP. So more recently, there was a study using nebivalol to treat the, in a, in, in rats with monocrotalin-induced pulmonary hypertension, and they compared that to metoprolol. And they showed that nebivalol was more potent, and it uh, improved endothelial dysfunction, pulmonary vascular remodeling, and right heart function. So, uh, is there any clinical data about using beta blockers in uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension? There, there was a prospective study by So et al. that looked at patients with PAH, and they found that beta blockade was actually common in these patients and was safe. There was another small prospective study done by Grennan et al., and this was in, uh, published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine in 2014. So it was a very small pilot study, six patients only, that were treated with carvedilol. So there wasn't a placebo arm. And the endpoint was uh, RV function by MRI. And we can see that uh, in their hands, uh, the RV ejection fraction improved in all patients. RV and diastolic volume that was, did not change. Some of them actually dropped. RV systolic volume dropped significantly and RV stroke volume improved. So this is over six months and it's a small study. This is some of the study using, uh, summarizing the use of beta blockers in, uh, in patients with PAH. Okay. So pulmonary arterial hypertension treatment with carvedilol for heart failure, the PATCH study. This is a study that was uh, I was part of at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. So we finished the last patient and we're currently analyzing the data. So the study was looking at also treating patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension with carvedilol, carvedilol and the endpoint was looking at PET scan before and after six months of treatment. And it was a randomized blinded study with three arms, placebo arm, carvedilol fixed dose, and carvedilol with dose escalation. So uh, we don't have, the, the data is being analyzed, so we have to stay tuned to see what we're gonna get out of this. Another uh, class category uh, to target RV failure, also from uh, left heart failure, are the uh, ACE inhibitors and ARB. So they play an important role in LV failure. In PAH, there's no strong clinical, uh, no strong evidence uh, clinically. Uh, in animal models, uh, there was the animal model of PA, uh, PA banding, where they showed that it improves RV function. However, in the other uh, models, there was no effect. Uh, other, uh, other RV targeted therapy being looked at, so metabolic modulators, since there's alteration in bioenergetic of the RV, antioxidant, tetrahydrobutyrin. There's also uh, RV pacing, uh, as non-pharmacological RV therapies, exercise, atrial septostomy, and then mechanical RV support and transplantation. So this is a quick summary. So the RV starts, uh, we start with functional RV hypertrophy, where there's sufficient RV hypertrophy, sufficient capillaries, sufficient energy, there's preservation of mitochondrial function, and the preservation of the RV arterial coupling. As the RV decompensate and goes into RV failure, then there's insufficient the hypertrophy, there's apoptosis, there's a decreased angiogenesis and capillary rarification, there's metabolic uh, remodeling and insufficient energy production, we get mitochondrial dysfunction, we get RV arterial uh, uh, uncoupling and increased oxidative stress and extracellular uh, matrix remodeling. So the goal of treating the RV should be to try to keep the RV here, so treating maybe early and, uh, or trying to move the, uh, the RV from here here, trying to maintain contractility at the reduced energy consumption, reducing fibrosis, improving capillary function, reducing uh, oxidative stress, inhibiting apoptosis, and maintaining sufficient myocardial hypertrophy.